Today is nonstop. And suddenly, your checking account is overdrawn. But what if we gave you more time on that one? At Huntington, if you accidentally overdraw your account by $50 or less, we've put a $50 safety zone in place, so you won't be charged an overdraft fee. It's one more way we're looking out for you. <laughs> so you can have time for what matters most. Huntington, welcome. $50 safety zone does not apply to returned items. Your account will be automatically closed if it remains negative for 60 days. Learn more at Huntington.com slash safety zone. We're always driving to dance lessons. So we signed up for Know Your Drive. We save money and get closer to her dancing dreams. The daring young man on the flying trapeze. Or maybe her singing dreams. Sign up for Know Your Drive and save up to 20%. American Family Insurance. Insure carefully, dream fearlessly. Products not available in every state. Discount terms apply. Visit amfam.com slash knowyourdrive for details. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, S.I. and its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. It's a, another film study. This is fun. This is where we get to look at the postseason games and get some extra Ravens games to discuss. Ken Kuzik, how you doing? Life's good, Josh. How about you? I'm doing great. I mean, this is a fun game to talk about. We, you guys do did the defense without me and Sarah, uh, and you talked about that. And I mean, the defense would put out one of the best games of the year. So I'm excited to see what the offense uh, tracks like on paper as well. Yeah, that, that was a lot of fun to do the episode of Sarah. We tried a new format on that. I want to try it on the offense again once too, but I want to just point people to that once. And I know most people will listen to both, but we did a review play-by-play. And despite me horrifically being bad with my own notes, I thought it was actually a really cool new format for the defensive show. I hope people give that a chance and just want to get that out up front. All right. And joining us for this as we look at the offense is Jordan Coe of the Situation Room. Jordan, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Josh and Ken. I'm happy to be here. Uh, We're thrilled right. to have you, Jordan. What, what, uh, what's going on in the Situation Room before we move on? Yeah, we've been we've been checking out um, kind of some of these past games, and we're trying to really really queue up um, what we're what we're doing heading into this week with Buffalo, and trying to track a little bit of what Buffalo's been doing, what happened in the matchup last year with the Ravens and Buffalo, what they might try and do, or what they might try and do differently. So, trying to get a little into those game plans and and see what we're take a peek ahead to next week. We'll want to talk about that on the show to whatever we level we can. I'm sure we have some mailbag questions that have come through and. We'll get a chance on that level too. But anyway, some good opportunities to uh, to talk through this. Really efficient comeback win. Uh, the Lamar Jackson run on a pr- what looked like a pretty critical third and nine situation really keyed a lot of that. And I thought the man defense that the Tennessee Titans were willing to play against Lamar really came home to roost on that play. I mean, they beat him. He beat him for a lot of other big plays, but that one in particular really turned the game. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, teams have this really hard choice between going with man or going with zone against the Ravens. And I mean, I don't know what I would choose if I was a defensive coordinator because Lamar has really, I mean, especially over the last six weeks, been keyed in throwing the ball, especially against the zone. And, and I, I don't know if that's Roman. I don't know if that's kind of Lamar's comfortability with getting more input in the game plan as kind of things roll on. But he seems to be locked in against the zone and, and forcing teams a little bit to, to have a, to play that man and open that up for those touchdown runs. Yeah, it's, it, that is definitely really sweet. And they have, you know, various route combinations they can run under those circumstances that will open up man even more. In this particular case, Bayard was the one guy who had a chance to make a tackle. He took a terrible angle to Lamar on the play. It's just inexplicably bad and, you know, had no chance effectively to, to cut him off on the play. It was a case where he probably should have been either going directly lateral towards the sidelines to try and stay ahead of the hip of Lamar, force him to cut back towards the middle of the field, or you know, maybe even angling back towards the sideline and really making it difficult for him to uh, you know to, to get that edge and at where he would have had him beat, or he did have him beat very easily. So uh, it, as an odd play, I, you, you, Bayard, a very savvy player, and now a veteran, you know, clearly in terms of his ability, it was, it was strange to see him make a play that bad. Well, I think he was. Cu- it looked like he was cutting off either like a a, a deep dig or or a short post. Um, 
from, I, I believe, Brown. And so I think his momentum was carrying him a little bit the wrong way to begin with. He might have had to kind of revert his hips back in the other direction. And, you know, you give Lamar that three quarters of a second to, to blur by you and you're not going to be able to catch up to him. But, you know, I think the irony is that where he was was cutting off the read that Lamar was looking at. And that's ultimately why Lamar took off and Lamar burned him for it. <laughs> All right. We want to get back to this. We want to talk starting with the offensive line, but first we got to do a little business. All right. It's that time of the year when divisions are decided, champions are crowned, and legends are bored. It's, of course, the NFL playoffs, and you know the name I'm going to talk about. It's my bookie, the industry-leading online sports book and casino, and it's not hard to understand why. With thousands of lines to bet on, all your favorite sports, the NFL, NBA, and college ball, check check and check mma and soccer they've got all the latest odds period and you can even take advantage of the my bookie prop builder and live in-game betting so that every single run throw touchdown is another chance for you to put cash in your pocket so visit their mobile friendly website today and get your deposit matched halfway up to a thousand dollars just by using the promo code ravens when you go ahead and make your first deposit. And the best part is it, they make it really simple, variety of ways to deposit, including credit card, bank transfer, Bitcoin, and more. So whether you're home or on the go, on your laptop or on your phone, it's not too late to make a New Year's resolution to get paid. So bet, win, and get paid over at my bookie. And Ken, you are muted. So while you fix that, I'll just let people know my big my bookie win this past weekend was Lamar Jackson to have the most yards uh, uh, rushed out of any player this weekend. Big win by jumping on Lamar. What what was the what was the payoff on that? Uh, five dollars turned into sixty five dollars. Nice, Ooh. very so nice. It was a really nice. It was really nice turnaround. All right, that's a good win. All right, let's talk some offensive line play. Uh, we'll start with the overall. I always like to start there. Sixty two scored snaps. The thing that held down scoring this week was five uh, sacks, three and a third of which were charged to the offensive line. There were other components to it, uh, but but most of those those sack charges went to the offensive line. Two thirds of a quarterback hit in total went to the OL. Thirteen pressures in total on twenty nine dropbacks is a high number. So there was also a fair number of pressures that were there. Lamar only ran the the offense out of one pressure, but it was the play of the game. We'll continue on. <laughs> Ample time and space on seven of 29 dropbacks, 24%, resulting in a passer sack. Nine balls out quick. One and a half runs for loss, charged the offensive line. So they got a little bit of everything, except they did not allow a penalty in this game. They don't have a penalty in this game, which is nice because the penalties have been a big part of the negative scoring in recent weeks. Um, I have some information here from last week. They pulled a tremendous amount in this game. I will have to count them up on my sheet. But the incredible thing we saw was a ton of counter play in this game with two man pulls from left to right, both left guard, left tackle and left tackle center. But it ended up with Orlando Brown pulling 15 times in one ball game, And they were long pulls, not shorts. Yeah, he they really I mean, they really broke this out in actually the first Titans game this year where they started these kind of two man counter pulls, um, either from the center and the guard co- coming with Brown. Um, and they, they love it. I mean, it's a great play. It, it you know, I, I don't know if you got a chance to, to see any of the, uh, ESPN did this mega cast and they had Brewski and Rex Ryan and Keyshawn Johnson, um, all breaking down film live during the game. And Teddy Brewski's head looked like it was going to explode when he was watching these counter pulls. Cause he was just, you know, he's like, I, you don't know where the key is. You don't know if it's going to be the center. You don't know if it's going to be the guard. Um, it was really great to hear, you know, a, a really intelligent linebacker like that talking about kind of how those pulls really do kind of mess with the heads of linebackers of the other team. Your second person who's mentioned that to me, and I've seen like 20 seconds of it today, but I, now I'm so upset that I missed that or, you know, didn't tape it even. But Rex Ryan, I heard was understand Keyshawn Johnson was on it for a little bit. Brewski, who else was it? Um, Booger McFarland and Mac Hass- Matt Hasselbeck. That's a pretty good, pretty savvy crew of, of ex-players and coaches that's, uh, that's right there. Uh, that counterplay has become a real staple. Obviously, they run it 15 times in one game. It doesn't really help offensive line scoring that much because there, there's a bunch of blocks that don't get converted. But it's not all about that. It's about selling a fake a little bit. And the Ravens have made it into a three-way play most of the time, usually without a pass option. But often they have 
either some sort of jet motion or some sort of orbit motion occasionally that goes opposite the counter. They have a direct-ahead option, which is typically Jackson himself. Could also be Jackson is the, is the run-right option. And then they have a run-right option to follow those counter, counter pullers. But they only come into play if Jackson says, okay, the numerical advantage over there is worth more than what that edge defender on the left side is doing to mess things up or whether or not I think I could beat the defensive tackle or whoever else he's reading on that play. But obviously a lot is asked of Jackson on this play. I don't really know if it's a one-read or two-read play. I don't think that's... I, I, I would question whether other people do know it. A two-read play is going to be much harder for Jackson. But what what are your thoughts on that, Jordan? Yeah, I think it might be a two-read play. And and the hmm. reason I think that, and, and I don't think it was when they started, but I think it might be now because the Ravens actually ran two R- fundamental RPOs in this game, which is something that, that I don't think I've seen the Ravens do all season, um, where you had them throwing to that flat out of the backside on that kind of – on the far side motion or the weak side or whatever you want to call that away from the opposite of the motion. Yeah, that's right. So you had the pullers coming out and it was def- they were run blocking and you had Lamar throw it to the, the backside in the flat both times picking up, I think four and eight yards. Um, to me, that says that that's that Lamar's got two reads there, right? First, he's got to read whether or not he's going to throw it immediately right off the spot. Mm-hmm. Um, but then he's got to decide whether or not he's going to hand that or he's going to make some other kind of give. So maybe, it, maybe it's a two read, but again, maybe not, you know, that could be one read pre-snap um or it could have the option you know after that to keep going right so and it could also just be one read that that his choice is really between pass left and run center or pass left and hand off it could just be just one choice but if forcing Lamar to make two reads it's advanced I'm, I'm not saying he's not at a point in his career where he couldn't you know run that sort of offense uh but it's a lot to ask and, and Roman it's easier to disguise how many total reads you need this brings up an interesting point, though. They're going to Buffalo this week, and I know I don't want to get. I know we're going to get back to this topic, but I think it's worth discussing now. If this is a high wind game, the need for multiple directional cues is greater than it ever was in the run game because a, a high wind game can result in some very packed boxes, and the Ravens are going to have to decide how do we create additional misdirection that will allow us still to run the ball under those circumstances. Yeah, you know, I, I think we'll see the Ravens just try and run to the edge more, whether whether the weather is bad or not. But in that instance, I think that's where the Ravens are going to find their most success. I think that was the thing that changed in the second half of this game overall. The Ravens were much more committed to getting all the way to the edge mm-hmm. before they kind of tried some of their, you know, I won't call it shenanigans, but the trickery or kind of the deception that was in there. It seemed like in very much in the first half that that both Dobbs and Lamar were trying to go inside of some of these pulling linemen and they weren't having any success and they were, they were like kind of waiting and then they'd shimmy and then they'd try and go to the outside and there was nothing there. Um, and to me, I think both the linemen, but also kind of the overall success of this offense will be predicated on them making a decision early on with that. If everybody is squeezed in, let's just try and get to the edge. Let's not mess around because we can beat them on the outside there especially for a team like Buffalo, we'll take Poyer, we'll take Edmonds out of that play. Um, we'll make them beat us with their cornerbacks who are not as physical, I think, as, as what... The, I don't think the game will be as physical as we saw from the Titans. I think if they take some of that hesitancy away, um, it could be a long day for the Buffalo defense. Right. And passing to the outside in this game may mean jet toss. It may not mean go outside, where I think there's some danger involved. In fact, looking back to some of the laterals in this last game... Boy, would I not want that lateral to Brown near the goal line made in the Buffalo wind. Oh, man. I I mean, at a very minimum, props to Greg Roman and Lamar Jackson for being able to make that call and execute it. But um, I totally agree. Props to Brown for hanging on to that ball when it's on the side of his helmet. But impressive. Impressive. Let's talk offensive line again. We're, we were, we're getting there. So Orlando Brown had 15 pulls, career high, by far the highest I've ever scored by a left tackle. It's just an absurd number. Um, I want to put that number in context. I think there's only been about 25 of slightly over 1,000, maybe 1,100 games I've scored in 15 years of doing that where a Raven has pulled 15 times in a single game. And the high ever came in this game also, by the way, and that was Bozeman with 22. But Orlando Brown's 15 poles for a left tackle is just out of this. It's so much higher than the second highest I've ever seen. It's it's not even funny. And and you know what? 
I wouldn't even be shocked if we saw it as something again similar to this in Buffalo. I think they're going to need to have so much of these triple potential positioning, and you really are going to need to have an, a power option among those if it's a condensed field game that I think they're going to want to set up more of this. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. The, the three-pronged nature of this has changed the zone read option, which was a two-pronged nature before mm-hmm. with kind of a one key, one read and go. And, and to some degree, Buffalo figured it out in the game we played against them last year. And then beyond that, I think the rest of the league kind of caught up to it, which which Greg Roman figured out pretty quickly through the first four or five weeks of the season. Um, you add this dynamic level where like, even when you put Dobbins in motion or Duvernay in motion behind that, and you get pools going in, in one direction, runners going in the other direction, Lamar kind of doing his thing, um, you know, like you were saying, they might not connect on these blocks as linemen, uh, but you've got to figure they, they really enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's definitely an interesting way to do it. And it puts Lamar in with more chances to get into space, as we saw in this game, as well as the other players. And, and we'll get to a little bit of that later. Um, Orlando Brown had some had some problems. And honestly, I think the three second standard as a pass blocker relative to what you'll see from PFF and other sources, it's two and a half seconds, was a little bit tougher on him. And he ended up with a D in this game. If I had given him 15 out of 15 on polls, which I don't do, he got nine out of 15 on polls. But if he'd given, if he'd had the last six, he would have moved up from a D to a C. So that wasn't really everything. It was really more about the pass blocking failures in this game. And uh, and he he had some. Uh, he's due. He's he's entitled to a mulligan. He certainly played very well on that side. Yeah, you know, he had a pretty poor game and and I, you know, not to not to bury the lead on you here, but I thought the offensive line overall just I thought they played a little passive generally yeah. and and Brown too. They just let the Titans play into them. They let them be the ones kind of dictating which way they, they were going to go and and were less decisive. And in the second half they got more aggressive with it and they just would go out and actually block guys and and get in their faces, you know. Brown on the on the four yard Lamar run in the red zone right before the sack, um, you know, Brown basically had a combo block where he didn't release to the second guy because and it just seemed to be a lack of aggressiveness to me. So mm-hmm. so I'm hoping to see them just get a little bit more forceful, you know, all across the line. But Brown in particular in, in Buffalo next week. Right. I, I agree. They really part of the problem was they really didn't have an answer for Simmons. And once they couldn't get him blocked, then that kills off a lot of your releases into level two because you can't really make easy releases, get, get get off that double team if he's penetrating a yard and a half into the backfield play after play after play. And they, they did have a lot of problems with that in this game. I'll move on. Bozeman, 22 pulls, the new individual record for a game. In fact, there's only been one other time where the left guard has pulled 22 times. That was in 2018. He pulled three. And James Hurst, of all people, pulled 19 times in that game. Uh, but new individual record for game. And he had a kind of a subplar. He had two where he gave up a half penetration or a half pressure on a pull. So he only scored 15 of the 22 points. Not ideal, not not certainly up to the standard that, that he's set for himself these last few weeks. High C in the game. It wasn't a terrible game. It just wasn't a great game from Bozeman like we've been seeing. He probably was the best Ravens lineman, I guess, of of, uh, of the five of them, although McCary played similarly okay in this game. But, uh, but no one just really stood out as being great. Yeah, you know, Bozeman has been so consistent this year. So, you know, and, and I don't think we've seen... You know, and I, you probably know these better since you're grading it. We haven't seen a lot of games where he plays kind of poorly in back-to-back games. Um, so I'm hoping that he comes back out with kind of some of those pool connects that that we didn't quite see this this past week. Yeah, it's, it's uh, he's passed up some blocks that are obviously schematic. Uh, in the Bengals game in particular, he's passed up Sam Hubbard a couple times on the right side to move to level two. So I know that's a schematic choice where they're leaving Hubbard and it didn't work out, which made it look bad, but it's, but that's the coach is telling him to do that. Obviously the, that's the, that's the, that's the plan. And then he's going to level two and not finding a block, which makes it look extra bad, you know, on the, on that kind of a play. It's just, he, the nice thing about it is when they, when they run the counter, he has the first block to make. So he always makes the juiciest in the backfield edge block. That's usually the easiest one to get. And then uh, oftentimes that's why scoring can get reduced a little bit from this. Orlando Brown has to turn the corner, find somebody in space. That's a much harder ask of a left tackle. 
Yeah. And, and usually they've both been a little bit better on it. I, you know, I, I don't, I, hopefully it was just the Titans in these guys head um, a little bit coming into this game. All right, let's move on. Patrick McCary, uh, some trouble with Jeffrey Simmons all through the game. He was one of the guys, he's not the only one who had trouble with him. Uh, solid C effort overall. Uh, he did give up, let me make sure I have this right here, a half a pressure, a third of a quarterback hit, and a third of a sack. So he was involved in several uh, different events in terms of pass rushes. Missed only four blocks, which is not too bad for a center. Uh, scored at the middle of the C range. You know, I don't grade on the curve. And it's absolutely fine. If all your if all your offensive linemen score a C, you're probably doing fine because you have the cohesiveness necessary to hold your run game together. And in, in particular for the Ravens, that's that's important. Nobody's screwing up so bad as a as a pass blocker or getting penalized a lot that the, you know they're costing you a lot of big plays in that regard. So I think you know I don't have any problem with that. But but uh, you know nobody's standing out in terms of grades. And some people do ask me, you know. You gave him a C again, you know, why do you hate him so much? You know, that's this kind of thing. But this is not bad at all. Yeah, and I also wonder if he's fully healthy um, and whether or not kind of schematically if the Ravens are doing a little bit to protect him and his back, that that, mm-hmm. that might have played any part in this. You know, Did who, you see indicators when you were watching the game that he might have been favoring something or, or not looking right? Not like indicators, but just not perform- performance-wise. You know, like on the sack that he took in the red zone when the Ravens finally got down there where, you know, Simmons and I forget who the other linemen were just basically – schooled both powers and Makari. Makari was kind of the bigger culprit powers kind of recovered from that one, but Makari didn't. And it just seemed like, I don't know, the strength just didn't seem like it might, might be there at the same level. But again, you know, the Titans really get up for these games. Um, and, and so it, it makes it a little harder to identify. Right. Okay. So this was the Brooks Reed sack. Yeah. Right. Okay. I actually gave half of that to Phillips and half the powers, none to McCary. So interesting. We'll have to take a look at that together maybe sometime, maybe after the show and and, and uh, think about that. But it's an interesting one. I, I, oftentimes, it's the other thing is the flush is the thing that I really penalize because it, oftentimes that will create movement by the quarterback that puts the uh, another blocker at a disadvantage. So the pocket doesn't have its integrity anymore. And now the, the guy, he is, is to the, the quarterback is to the side of where the blocker is and you just can't hold that block anymore. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Ben Powers, seven missed blocks in this game. He had portions of two sacks, a total of five, six. That's a half plus a third. Um, it, it was not a bad game for Powers, but he'd been playing better, and this was a C. Uh, not, not a terrible effort again, but uh, but he, he's he's been doing better. I think we've come to expect more of Ben Powers now, haven't we? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I also wonder whether, you know, whether some of this was scheme and and kind of what the you know what the Titans were doing, they did a there were a lot of a gap blitzes or at least fainting of a gap blitzes or run blitzes through the gaps where they were you know they did a lot to try and kind of squeeze everything together and so you know it seemed like Powers was a little overwhelmed by that um, or the whole interior of the line was a little overwhelmed by that so it's always hard to separate whether or not some of that was just miscommunication passing guys off not sure where they're coming from you know and taking kind of being a half step late and that's that to me that's where the aggressiveness matters you know it's like i'm going to go block that guy we're going to be like these these are my assignments and i'm not going to worry about it if that that assignment ended up being a miss seemed like there was a little questioning in that process to me from the offensive line this week yeah this is an interesting point you you just brought up with regard to buffalo who likes to show a lot of simulated pressure and sometimes they bring it but they like to stuff the a gaps and is is that a concern for this interior offensive line as currently structured uh, with Bozeman, McCary, and Powers? I mean, I think it is, and that's that's part of why I think the Ravens have to be dedicated to getting to the edges on these guys. Um, like you know, use use Brown pulling when it's going in that direction. Kind of use the motion and kind of the head start going the other direction. Um, you know, don't, don't let them beat you on the interior. But you know, at the same time, the interior defensive guys for Buffalo are. They've got nobody on the level the level of Simmons, mm-hmm. and and I think that's going to be part of it. They, you know, if you look at and I, I don't put a ton of stock in PFF, but you know, if you look at their PFF grades on the defensive line, they're not good for Buffalo. Yeah, not great tacklers across the board. That's where I think that, that the Ravens' run game could really lean on them. One of the issues that that is coming to mind now is if they would want to go motion to the middle with a tight end or fullback the way they have with Ricard, with Boyle, with Tomlinson, players like that. They, that motion is going to be a scarce resource in a game like this if they if they have some packed boxes because you're probably better off showing a speed option to the to opposite your 
counter to give them another look in that way than you are trying to pack the box with another, uh, you know, with one more blocker when the when the box is so crowded to start with. That's my strong preference, and I and, and I, I would have said the same thing heading into this Titans game. I actually think that there are some pretty strong overlaps in the middle of this defense, especially kind of in the A gaps about how Buffalo and Tennessee kind of approach in Mm -hmm. particular Lamar and and the running quarterback. So I totally agree. We need motion to the edges, a lot of like a lot of lateral, a lot of lateral movement, or even a willingness to, to be more spread out and go wide. I know the Ravens kind of like to keep it tight because it lets that flat leak. If there's off pressure kind of be an easy dump off. Um, But you get the same action if they go out wide and you throw it all the way out wide. And I'd rather, I'd rather they kind of keep them spread out in an effort to kind of shut that down. We saw them do that in the Cleveland game on the the one Lamar Jackson touchdown. They, they started where they were packed in the box and there were eight or nine guys in the box. They spread out and only, and only ends up being six guys And Lamar. Uh, he didn't skate in, but it was a pretty easy run up the middle for him to get in for the touchdown. All right, move on to DJ Fluker. He he got the start in this one. Let me confirm that. He did not get the start. Phillips got the start. We'll talk about him first. I liked Phillips' games in a lot of ways. He, he It was not a game without warts, but I thought he was quite physical in the run game, particularly late. Probably was the Ravens' most physical run blocker. Um, he... He was bulled by Brooks Reed early in the game for a half sack. He had shares of a couple pressures, but I thought as the game wore on, he was the guy who was getting more push into level two. Sometimes it's a down block and then a half level up kind of kind of opportunity, but there are other times he was just pushing his guy uh, on that right edge more than the other linemen were getting push. Yeah, I, you know, I think the potential for Phillips to be something, you know, the next few years is really there, and he got thrown a little into a little more into this but he can be really ferocious at the point of attack sometimes um and i i I, you know he's not there yet (laughs) when you say he's not without his warts i think that's the right way to put it but i think i think there's something there yeah all right warps uh, uh, (laughs) warts phillips had a c in this game uh as well let's move on to fluker uh he'd been playing very well and generally he's been playing very well although it's been a it's a sign curve of performance sometimes with his. It's, it's kind of like more, more time at the high end of that, uh, which is not a sign curve. And I know you math guys out there. But he had trouble uh, on the right edge this game a little bit. Um, he, he got run out of one pressure by Lamar, which is good that that happened. It means that he was less effective as a pass blocker. He did get two-thirds of one sack charge. Honestly, to me, it looked like he's playing hurt, that he didn't really have the mobility to block 12 to 6 the way he'd been able to before and and really make that work in the same way. Yeah, he I I, I would put it the same way. He he definitely didn't look healthy and you know the Titans do a pretty good job on the edge too. I I feel like they were they were putting pressure there and kind of running a little kind of contain-ish action from the edge guy and and that's just not Fluker's game to 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 handle effectively either. Now, Brooks Reed, he's the same Brooks Reed who has been in the league for a very long time, right? Yeah, you know, my co-host of the Situation Room, Gabe, was asking me the same thing. He said, I didn't even know Brooks Reed was still in the league when that sack happened. (laughs) Yeah, it's incredible. So he he did play previously in a playoff game in Baltimore with the 2011, 2011 Houston Texans. So incredibly, he's been around. He had six sacks as a rookie. He was looking like a pretty good player. And his career was pretty much a ski slope after that. It wasn't bad in his, in his years at Houston. And then he, uh, he hasn't played too much since. And I guess he's one of these late career practice squad guys who got another opportunity to play for a contender. Yeah, I was, I was, he, he also got some time, what, in Atlanta, right? Is that, yeah. is that right? Yeah. So, you know, and he, he played really effectively for the Titans. <laughs> Was a was a uh, remarkable. I, that one of the things that that I we talked about in advance with Mike Herndon was that they'd had a lot of trouble with their edge rushers, and I, it's no secret they had 19 sacks all year. And and Landry was really the only guy who was providing anything. And you need to have some kind of critical mass of pass rushers or scheme like the Ravens do to to make things work. And and they really hadn't found that magic formula yet. But but Brooks Reed seemed like a good addition, and I, I bet he has earned a spot somewhere in the NFL based maybe on this game. 
Yeah, you know, when you say that, Ken, it, it makes me think a little, you, you know, there was a lot of consternation in the Twitter world, uh, <laughs> right right around halftime that the Ravens had given up four sacks in, in this game. And, you know, I think that was a little overstated in the sense that of what you just said. I think the way Tennessee approaches Baltimore is different than the way they approach everybody mm-hmm. else on defense. And so scheme actually works to their favor a little bit against what Baltimore tries to do from a sack perspective versus other teams. Um, And and that's, you know, part of why, you know, when we talk about some of these grades for these offensive linemen, I think, I think Tennessee's scheme and and that pressure in the middle of the defense had more to do with it than kind of anything telling about the future of this offensive line play. It's, that's a great point. And, and, you know, the other team, regardless of who they are, is not a set of robots who's been wound up and set to play. They have the ability just to. They are going to try hard to figure out what you're doing and, and, and figure out what it'll take to beat you. And when we talk about halftime adjustments, well, guess what? They're trying to make them too, about, you know, trying to figure out what's, you know, what's going wrong with what we're doing and, and, uh, and make it work. But we wouldn't expect the same game plan from Wink Martindale every, every week, and we shouldn't have expected it from, from the Titans either. Yeah, Even definitely. though they don't, tradition, they don't technically have a defensive coordinator, do they? Vrabel <laughs> Bra- right. said something about it, that <laughs> who had the job after the game. All right, we'll poke at them too much. We've, had, we've stopped on their logo enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Matt Skura, active as a sixth offensive lineman, made four of his five blocks. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that he's accepted this role. I guess Prince was active. No, no, Prince was not active for this game. So there was a seventh offensive lineman, eighth offensive lineman active. And who was it? Was TCC active? I guess he must have been. He so he, to, didn't, yeah. he, he didn't get any playing time. Um, but, uh, but you never know when we might see him again, obviously if McCary, if there's a problem with McCary, it's likely that, uh, that he'd be the next choice as we saw, uh, recently. All right, well, let's go on and have some fun. Talk about Lamar here. Uh, I really want to hear your comments. So why don't you start off with Lamar comments and I'll kind of, kind of filter in some stuff. Yeah. You know, I thought Lamar, I, I mean, obviously Lamar played a fantastic game. You know, you, you can't, you can't argue with the final results and that the, the electric touchdown play you can't say a whole lot more than it than than that's Lamar, right? Lamarvelous, right? Um, we just have to sit in awe. But you know, my thing with Lamar is pre when him going down for COVID, what we what we saw from Lamar was I don't want to call it overthinking because I don't think it was overthinking. It's just slight hesitancy. He was he would make throws a second too late. He'd make decisions a second too late. He'd break the pocket. A second's probably even too much time. He'd break the pocket half a second too late, make a throw half a second too late. And that was throwing the timing off of a lot of things. Um, And it felt like at times in this game, Lamar was kind of ebbing a little bit back to not playing fast enough, not thinking through plays, not being ahead of what the defense was trying to do to him. And, you know, the the play that stood out to me the most was the sack that he took in the red zone. Um, You know, the pressure was coming. For sure, but Mark he had looked the middle linebacker off of Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews was kind of running kind of like that fake in and then out dig route. And Mark Andrews was coming wide open into the flat, and Andrew or Lamar could have just kind of thrown him open. And instead, Lamar kind of starts to look that way and then just kind of eats the ball. Now, maybe he thought the pressure was going to get there to him, but that should have been kind of the read there when when it was all kind of set up and and the, the, the NFL guys in Bruski in particular, or Keyshawn Johnson in particular was hard on Lamar about this. He thought he should have gotten that ball out and gotten it to Andrews and it would have been a touchdown. I agreed. Um, and I'd say that that'd be my only thing for Lamar. He just, he's got to trust what's in front of him. He's got to trust his reads and his guys. And if he just plays through that, which I feel like he did for the last five weeks, he is unstoppable. Um, and, and that's part of what makes Mahomes so good. Mahomes just trusts what he's going to do and he does it. And he makes mistakes sometimes, but, but, it more often than not, it works out. And I think the same thing would happen for Lamar. Right. I, I like that. I, I think Lamar did make other mistakes that were potentially costly. The throw in the end zone to Andrews probably should have been intercepted. It was, the route was undercut. The defender had a chance at it. Andrews might have maybe had a chance at it too, but the defender really had the first chance at that ball, which is what I don't, I don't like. The other ball I didn't really, I really didn't like was the ball on first down after the turnover thrown to Brown on the roll right. I, I have no problem, by the way, with the play call, trying to put the game away with a first down there to Brown. But I do have a problem with the throw itself, is that you're not that wasn't the spot to beat the defense. There was a there was another spot, namely closer and letting letting um, Brown run laterally for the ball that was safer. And where he threw it, he actually put it in a position where a tip could have gone to Bayard and it almost did. Yeah, you know, 
<laughs> definitely. I agree. Not the right read, not the right throw. Um, but if, if Greg Roman could stop running two vertical routes within like two yards of separation <laughs> from each other, like my, I, I would be in shock, right? Like one of those guys should be running, like essentially one of them should be running North and one of them should be running kind of like a deep slant or a post or a dig. And the fact that they're running together there makes that a really hard throw for Lamar too. Cause he's just throwing into traffic. You know, I, I was looking at the Titans game from last year and that we were talking about kind of the, the beautiful throw Lamar made to Hollywood in this game, kind of down the, down the corner. Um, and he made a similar throw to Brown last year, and I was rewatching it, and it was the same thing where you had Hollywood and somebody to his outside, both running north south, both outside of the numbers together. And it's and to me, that's part of the risk of that play. You take away the ability for Lamar to kind of choose where he wants to throw it, and uh, that part, part part of me thinks that that's on Roman, and it's not neither coached up in advance schematically or read wise. Like if 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 Roman can't make the right decision about. The, the route tree patterns that he wants to run in combination together. He's probably not advising Lamar about where to place the ball very well in advance of that either. Yeah. That's an interesting observation. That that certainly could be true. Do you, do you think the Ravens have too much love for vertical routes in general because they don't need a check down option as often, meaning that they're more likely to try for three verticals on one side to clear out as opposed to, make it an easy throw to create space for Lamar to run as they would think of. I don't have a problem with multiple verticals. And and if you go back to the touchdown in the um, in week 17 against the Bengals, you've got basically a four verticals play that got Brown open on that deep crosser. It's to me, that's the concept, right? Why have Brown and somebody to his right, both running North South, just, just bend him to the inside. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even have to be a defined post. It's just like kind of that deep middle crosser. And you put a lot more stress on that defense. Yeah, Force the safety to make a choice. And then when he does, he's chosen and wrong if you can throw it to either I, that you know the the touchdown that, that reminds me of is the touchdown to andrews and i'm trying to remember if that was the cleveland game or exactly what a game what was but brown ran a a uh, route which forced that high safety to make a choice to come to him and you'd think that boy you know andrews is his favorite target or maybe not but but brown even though he's having a lot of problems of receiving at that particular point in the season had you know drew the defense with him and left andrews open for a fairly easy pitch and catch it was the titans game it was the first titans it was game. the first titans game yeah it was the, and that concept was I, I mean those concepts are easy and and i i mean subtle adjustments to kind of the same kind of play calls that we're making in those situations that would, I think in a lot of ways, improve them. Um, I did have a problem with that, that kind of look though, you know, I, I think the Ravens should have run something underneath that, that would have given somebody a chance to run for a first down there. Um, but if they didn't made it a little bit easier of a field goal attempt and, you know, Tucker missed that one because he, it looked like he slipped a little bit, which is mm-hmm. tremendous where, where the kick ended up, it was still straight and it was almost good enough. Um, even though he slipped, which says how great Tucker is, but why not kind of take the five yards that they might give you underneath? And if somebody can win and, and pick up that first down, great. If not, you know, okay, it's we're going to take the points goal. we're going to take anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I was a little bit worried. Actually, Tucker did not look that good in the pregame and he was missing some kicks from about 52 to 54 yards and it it just it did not give me a good feeling for him to line up with that. In fact, the second one did not give me a good feel either because it was pretty much the same distance. I didn't notice at the time the slip on the on the first kick, but the, it was nice to see the second one on on more normal trajectory in terms of getting there. All right. One thing else I want to say about the about Lamar, maybe there's two, but but number one is the the interception of Boykin, horribly thrown pass. But how do you think that Lamar? thinks of Boykin on the play. Something tells me that Andrews would have tracked that ball sooner and had a chance to get back on the defender and tackle him or, you know, break him in two or whatever was necessary to make sure that he couldn't make that interception. Yeah. I I mean, Boykin definitely, you know, it must be a scheme thing. It must be a scheme thing that the Ravens are asking other wide receivers to do in these situations. Cause this interception looked just like the one in the other Titans game as well, Mm -hmm. where Duvernay was running one-on-one down the field with the, with the defender and Lamar underthrew it by 
20 yards, right? And same thing happened with Boykin. And in both instances, neither of them turned around to look for the ball until the ball was halfway or more to them. And so it tells me that Lamar is pulling the string too early on, on that for what is being coached up to these wide receivers. Or or uh, that that's the only explanation for me that, that that's why that could happen. Right. We have, there's been a, a, a recurring pattern of Lamar having bad underthrows. And, and it, that's goes, that goes back before this year. But, but last year did a very good job of protecting the football by, by trying to throw it to open space. And it almost seems like that's more of what's necessary. He's not, he's not leading his receivers enough, which says to me, go ahead and lead the defender. Because if, if you can outthrow him, your guy is faster, whether that's you know Boykin or Brown or Duvernay probably, any of them have a good chance to get to that open field a sp- a spot on the field and make a play. And if they don't, good chance that the defender, realizing that they're behind them, is going to do something stupid. So you, you, you've got multiple choices to, to, to make that right, but you've got to get that ball over the defender's head to have a real chance. And based on what happened with both the Duvernay and Boykin interceptions, you've got to believe that that's what they're thinking as wide receivers, right? I'm going to keep my head down and I'm going to keep running as hard as I can because at some point I'm going to look up and the ball is going to be flying over the top of my head and I'm going to need to go deep to make a play on it. Yeah, I mean, it it would, I guess it would be great if it, uh, Lamar, if you get him to the microphone, he's always going to take responsibility for that. He knows what the right thing to say is. I just wonder if there's not an alarm going off in his head that's saying, okay, Boykin, who was only at seven trust points relative to Andrew, Andrew's 134, just went down to five after that play. So it's, it's, I know it's a currency. You know, it goes back and forth after the touchdown pass, which is just a beautiful pass, thrown beautifully, caught right as it should have been, in stride, lots of yak for the touchdown for, for Boykin last week. This just had to set him back some. Lamar seems much more accurate to me on deep post routes than he does on deep, deep sideline side. routes. Yeah. Um, and Hollywood Brown was running a deep post on this play and had ample separation where if Lamar would have underthrown Hollywood, it probably still would have been a touchdown. Um, and so, you know, I, the, to, to me, to some degree, use those outside routes with Duvernay and Boykin as decoys in those instances um, and, and throw the ones that you're more comfortable with. Um, especially when you've got both Andrews and Brown that are probably going to be working deep on a play like that. We saw the good, the, the deep throw to Brown down the right sideline I really liked. Now, he did not have... It, it, it was brought up on Twitter today by Dev Penchwa that he thought that it reminded him a lot of the Arizona Week 2 catch last year where he ran down the sideline, basically won the game on, I think, a third and 10, third and nine kind of play uh, where he ran, you know... a. a as vertical a route as you can run, straight up the field and effectively write down the numbers. But the key thing was he left himself space to then cut to the outside, break quickly to the football at the last moment, which still allowed for a creation of separation from that cornerback. So he didn't he didn't have the the area covered. And and this was very similar, but he was kind of breaking towards the corner with the initial route, but then the ball was still further to the outside and he broke off uh, at the last moment to, to catch that football. Beautiful play. Uh, and, and Brown really showed off, so I thought, some receiving skills on it. Yeah, I actually replied to Dev's tweet about that with the with the uh, play that Brown made in the last Titans game that I was talking about. That, that mm-hmm. kind of, I wouldn't call it a fade, but, you know, not a corner, but it is kind of headed to the sideline. It is sure. vertical. Um, and it looked just like the same play, you know, and Lamar drops it between three guys in that game. Oh, you're um, talking about now the, the last Titans playoff game. Playoff the game. one at home, yeah. yeah. That's right. That's... Um, and it's same spot, same throw, same route. That was a, that was just an amazing. I, I sitting at the ballpark, couldn't believe that ball was complete. Caught it with one hand too. I mean, it was just one outstretched, three defenders around. How could he hang on to that ball? I mean, you, you... and and Hollywood seems comfortable to me. And th- this is what what probably annoys me the most about the Boykin and, and Duvernay interception going kind of going back to both games is that. Lamar doesn't seem comfortable throwing the deep ball to those guys, but he does seem comfortable throwing that same ball to Brown in that instance and it being a lot closer to him. So don't, don't make him throw it to the guy that he's not comfortable with. Don't run Boykin on that route. Right. Or, or at least tell Lamar, look, he might be open, but like, look, Hollywood's going to be over the middle. You've done that a million times. If he's open, that should be your first read, not Boykin. Yeah. I think the first read is enough. Honestly, one of the things that's really bothering me is that they won't, take chances with Boykin on vertical routes. And that means his trust balance has to stay at five and doesn't have a chance to grow beyond that. And, and, you know, it's, it's just not a good place to be. They need to figure out how to get him involved in the offense. If they're ever going to figure out what they have in him as a receiver. 
And, you know, one of the nice things about Boykin this year has been he's contributed to some extended plays. That, to me, is always a big thing. Now, he'd done that in the end zone before, but he's done that over the middle of the field and and roaming to the right sideline because he almost always lines up on the left sideline to to try and help out on an extended play. That's one of the things I've been happiest about. Yeah, absolutely. We need, you know, that'd be the one thing that I think talking a little bit about Buffalo that Josh Allen does exceptionally well with his receivers. They all seem in sync about where they need to go when he breaks the pocket, where Mm -hmm. the spot is, and he knows where he needs to throw it. And if Lamar had that kind of chemistry with his receivers, when he breaks the pocket, this league better watch out. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it, he'll he'll develop that with some other receivers as as time moves on. But boy, you just you got to figure out how you can get get them together and and work on some of that chemistry. Thinking ahead to the Buffalo game now, a little bit of what you're mentioning because Buffalo is going to play a lot of receivers per play in this game, assuming it's not a completely windy day that has to change their plans. But they'll see a lot of eleven, and the and the the Bills actually play a lot of ten also, which means the Ravens going to have to go to four cornerbacks, four cornerback dime a lot. I I presume. And it may also be a game where they finally decide J. Ron Curse is the right guy and they need to bring in a, a, a professional dime back instead of, you know, putting Chris Board there, a guy who's who's played in a proxy role this whole year. Yeah, and I love Chris Board and and he's done an admirable job, but but I'd much rather see Curse out there. You know, the Ravens, you know, or um oh, who just came back from the IR? No. Um Harris, Devontae Harris, I think, oh. just got activated off the IR as well. Yes. So, you know, I, I want that to be a, a, an actual defensive back for this game in particular. And they're going to so need it, you know, if they win for the Kansas City game, too. You would consider Harris a, a, as a dime back or put Harris on the back end, or what would you try and do? Yeah, as a dime back, or, you know, I. I would. I, I think that Josh Allen was really effective against the Colts, um, throwing to the slots when they weren't, when they essentially weren't coming off on the line and playing press against them, or mm-hmm. maybe not press, but like just letting a free release, seven eight yards, and Allen was just lighting them up on that. And I would love, you know, I have no problem with the Ravens running out four cornerbacks and lining them up on the four wide receivers, and whether it's man or zone, um, do whatever iteration of that they need. You know, you saw a really great play in the Titans game where Humphrey and Peters looked like they were playing man, but they, they basically switched off their guys and yes. totally full Tannehill. It was fantastic communication. Uh, you know, the Ravens can do that kind of thing where they bring guys up to the line, but also confuse Allen about what he's going to see on, on the back end. And it was set up well because they basically played press the entire game. That didn't mean necessarily that Humphrey put his hands on Brown the entire game, but he was in his face at the line of scrimmage, and that forces him to work on different release techniques. And, you know, Humphrey can, at his leisure, decide this is the one that I'm going to disrupt timing-wise in a different manner. I also thought, frankly, Brown did a fantastic job relative to his opportunity set in terms of catching the football. I mean, you never expected to make that many completions on so many closely contested footballs. He obviously, the pass interference in the end zone that didn't get called, we won't forget. I mean, we may consider it even based on the on the Peters interception at the end of the game. But the play down the left sideline that went for 28 yards when when Humphrey was right there. I mean, it's that's that's incredibly fortunate that you know that he makes that reception and Humphrey isn't able to 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 get a piece of it or do what he usually does, which is basically hit the guy with a baseball bat, his namely his arm across his two forearms. Yeah. I mean, the Ravens forced Tannehill to throw deep and to the far sideline as best they could all the time. And it really took away the easy throws from him. You know, like, like the one that we saw with the tight end that ran across, like they took Ferkser. those kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, Ferkser, they took those kind of throws away. And then Tannehill had to make the tough throws and, you know, the Ravens were, you know, the, the overthrow that he had on um, the deep out, I don't think it was to Brown, but there was a, maybe to Davis um, on a third down um, when they kicked the first field goal. Um, you know, Peters was right there in his pocket and was, was if, if Tannehill doesn't throw that to the right spot, Peters was going to undercut it and he was going to, he was going to intercept it. Um, and, and the Ravens did a good job of forcing him to make those kind of throws. I think they'll do or should do the same thing to Josh Allen. Well, it's it's uh, it's going to be a great game. Now, in in terms of the three point oh four time to throw metric for Josh Allen, do you think that plays into his hands or against him with the Ravens? And I'll, I'll give you I'll give you my thoughts on this first because hey, I said it, so I can give my thoughts on it, right? That's what we are as human beings. But anyway, the, 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 my thoughts on the matter are that that the the three point oh four times a second could be a gift. That you know it it, it 
if he's really thinking he can extend that pocket that long, that brings into play a lot of the schematic pass rush elements that the Ravens have in their arsenal. Stunting becomes much more valuable. You can bring pressure from all the different places the Ravens do and, and have it get home. I think Allen, despite the fact that he's played very well against the Blitz, he hasn't necessarily done it against the kind of teams. He's done it more probably against the kind of teams that have very easy pickings at one of the three or four spots where he has one of his quality receivers on the field. And the Ravens, with their ability to put four corners on the field, I think inherently I have a better chance to get pressure on Allen. And then I'm going to add one factor to that. How about some wind? Yeah, I, I mean, the weather could be, uh, you know, everyone's kind of talking about Lamar not being able to play in the snow, but bad weather would be, would bad passing weather would be really bad for Buffalo um, mm-hmm. overall, I think, for this game. But, you know, I, I totally agree with you. You know, I, I think that the Ravens are going to be able to bring pressure with four guys too. Um, you know, Judon and Agakawe are going to be able to get after it from the ends. And if you let, I, first of all, I think Justin Matabike is going to have a really big game because the interior offensive line of Buffalo is not very good. Um, and he has just been playing like a man. He's been throwing guys around. So if you put you put Campbell um, and you put Matabike kind of over the guards or even Wolf and you let them kind of play this, you know, think of it like two gapping when you're run defending. Right. And you're waiting to see you're waiting, you're waiting, you're pushing your guy back. But you want to see what Josh Allen's going to do, because sometimes what will happen is Ngaku or whoever your end is rushes up the side and then Allen will kind of slip in behind those guys. Right. And if you're if your two D tackles are ready for that and they break to the outside when Allen does that, they're going to be right in his face the whole time. Or if he breaks to the inside, if you either have a spy or you let the or you, you can two gap it and go to the inside there, that it, it's going to give him fits if they can keep him in the pocket. I, I don't know how against the Ravens cornerback quality that you were just talking about, how he's going to get anything done at all. I, I, I can't not talk about this, even though we're on the offensive show, but it doesn't he actually provide a use for Patrick Queen as well, that he, he's a wonderful spy as all the kind of lateral speed and enough size to get Allen to the ground, even though Allen is a very big guy. Uh, I, I think he's he's a big asset to have against a quarterback like that. And you can set him on the pass rush, too. I don't think that necessarily means Allen gets away. He's very quick for that sort of thing. I just think that where he's going to give you problems is if you, de- if you depend on him in any way for coverage in a game like this where the, where the Bills wide receivers are just going to be running circles around him. Yeah, and they don't have great running back receiving options or tight end mm-hmm. receiving options. So this this seems like the this seems like the perfect game for guys like Matabike against the weak interior offensive line and Patrick Queen to really show up as rookies, you know, in a playoff game for this team. Let's toss out one more out there. You mentioned Ngakwe earlier, but Ngakwe against the Titans, terrible matchup for him. There's a limited number of snaps that he can even play when Derrick Henry is a threat to be running on second and long. So yeah, I my own personal opinion, I never want him in there on first down. It's just, it's too much of a liability as a runner. The only time I'd want him on first down is when the other, you're, you're nursing a big lead and, and you, you have the ability to go hunt down after down after down. But if it's, if it's second and 10, but now maybe it's second and six against Buffalo in a situation like this, I love having him on the field. He creates all kinds of additional opportunity for your defense to, to create pass rush against a guy who likes to hold the football. Yeah, it'll. I'm fascinated to see the chess match that Wink's going to play with Buffalo's offense because, I, you know, if it were me, I would dare them to run. You know, I, I, I'm going to let Devin Singletary beat me, right? Like, like mm-hmm. if you want to give him the ball 30 times and he wants to run it for 175 yards, good luck. Like, go for it. <laughs> Got some good data on that from last year. And every Bills fan will say, doesn't matter. He's beaten the Blitz this year. He didn't beat the Blitz last year. 27 times in the 2019 game in December, the Ravens rushed five plus. The Bills had eight net yards on those plays, 0.3 yards per play. The other one represents the choice you're talking about with Singletary. They played the dime defense 29 times. Nine times the, the Bills ran, and they got 87 yards on those plays, 9.7 yards per carry. Well, that's unacceptable, right? It is, except that they also passed it 20 times for seven net yards, 0.4 yards per carry. And that is acceptable, and the net is certainly acceptable too. So it's something where I think the Ravens understand very well the choices they're they're making based on package. Martindale does has proven to be an expert in this over time. And despite the fact that I I, I wholly agree, Allen is a better player than he was last year. I just I don't think the Bills completely understand, or Bills fans certainly completely understand the danger they're in. Uh, with regard to Allen as uh, being under pressure and, and what that might mean in this game. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, when, when you've got Marcus Peters playing on a hot streak too, I mm-hmm. think that that's something to watch out for because, you know, he goes through these, you know, he, he's your, your sign cosine player to me. He has his ups and downs and, yeah. and, and really can just go into ruts where he's guessing too much and he's in his own head and he's not making good plays, but he played phenomenal in the Tennessee game. He is fired up for this. And, and I think that, you know, I, I think he could have a big day, too, because Allen does try and squeeze it in there sometimes, especially when he's under that duress. And to me, the difference is not just blitzing, it's pressure, right? When I've watched Josh Allen the last the last couple of days, he's good against the blitz when they pick it up. But when he's got pressure and he can't slip the pocket, he's he's careless with the ball and he makes really poor decisions. Mm hmm. All right, well, that's great. We, we, we definitely need something to look forward to there because they have a very scary passing offense. Let's get back to the Ravens offense, though, because that's what we're supposed to be talking about here. I wanted to discuss a little bit of scheme, and we already did talk about the number of counter plays going down by tick sheet here. They won the snap count battle again, by the way. Huge value. Most of that comes on defense to win 62-49, but that really kept their defensive line fresh going into this next game. That comes on the heels of only allowing 40 snaps to Cincinnati, so that's really nice. All right, yeah. nothing. He, he's the best <laughs> color man in the business, folks. Anyway, the pony backfield on two plays again in this game. And I think we'll see more of that in this next game if they're trying to use these multiple eyes looks where they may want to run wide in two different directions or run it up the middle. You know, I would uh, I, I would take as many of these pony looks as, as you can give because I think that Gus Edwards, who is criminally underrated across the board mm-hmm. as a Raven by every but not every, most fans, um, is a phenomenal blocker against yes. Dimebacks. Phenomenal blocker against Dimebacks. Take every package that you put Ricard standing in, next to Lamar with a running back next to him and make it Dobbins and Edwards. Um, and I think that would be highly, highly valuable. All right. Well, I still love Ricard, too. I think I he, too. He, he certainly provides you. But there's certainly blocks on the edge. And, you know, these are blocks that Hayden Hurst was making last year out of the backfield. You know, Edwards is a very competent guy at that. And, I, and they, you know, he's, he's certainly good, good. Didn't he have two blocks in front of Lamar on one play in this last game? Yes, it, on the, well, it was the same guy, but um, it, was, it was on that kind of quarterback lead run to the right where usually they pull a guy. They didn't pull the guy, and I think that threw Tennessee off. But, you know, Edwards just got up there, blocked one guy, and then hit the safety twice running down the field. It was, it was a, a great play. All right. Patrick Ricard, don't know if we talked about him already today, but 51, then 49 snaps. Played 100 snaps last two weeks. His two highest totals of the of his career in these last two weeks. Uh, th- that change coming out of halftime really is the counterexample to any notion that you can't make changes at halftime. <laughs> yeah. The, well, the, you know, the Ravens did... What I saw from the Titans when they were motioning, when the Ravens were motioning in the first half, the safety on the side that they were motioning to was coming down into the box and basically playing it like a run. And so when that, what the Ravens needed a response to that, which was basically backside action, they could either be kind of like that jet sweep threat, which didn't what the Titans weren't biting on. So they had to release somebody backside into that flat and throw it to them um, and do it from the other side, the way that they were kind of sometimes counter pulling or, you know, whichever way that they were going on that. And it was, it was devastatingly effective. Mm -hmm. Three times on on that drive. Obviously, his receptions really keyed a lot of what happened, getting it down the field, two of the first downs on on plays to him. What was so sweet about the entire thing is they didn't really feel the need to pull it out again after that. And by the time the Titans understood what was going on, there really wasn't a way for them to change it. Yeah, and and one of those receptions wasn't even one of those flat throws. It was Ricard ran basically yes. Willie Sneed's route. I loved that one. Yes, <laughs> you know it, the I, I was thinking of the total number of times I've seen a fullback run a route in the middle of the field that's over a yard, <laughs> and <laughs> and I have to go back to like Vontae Leach in in the opening play of Super Bowl Forty Seven. I mean that's about the last time. I think there might have been one other because I remember having this discussion before. But it's it's so rare. It's so rare. Use check. I, honestly, it ran a little bit. He was unusual in his in his respective running routes down the field but the Ravens had so full few fullbacks in their history who ran more than a couple lo- yards past the line of scrimmage well and if they could use Ricard and Edwards and Dobbins at in the slot even at that and that's just kind of like that sit route that push 
puts pressure on the other team, right? Because you've got a guy coming out in the flat, which holds the corner. You've got that guy kind of sitting there in the seam. You've got your inside, you know, usually your safety over the top and your inside linebacker has to make a choice to come under. And likely Andrews is coming over the middle there. You put Mm -hmm. all kinds of stress on a team. And if they actually... You know, for this in this case, they just said we're not going to defend Ricard, right? And and I think in a lot of cases they wouldn't defend Edwards in the same way. There are big opportunities for the Ravens, I think, to continue to exploit that look. You know, it's it, the throw itself was another underthrow by Lamar, and even these short distance ones where he kind of hands the ball to the guy rather than throw it to him. I just wish he'd have given Ricard a high ball to handle there because there were there was yak to be had on that play. And, you know, Ricard mit, or Lamar missed another throw. It was rushed a little bit because he had pressure in his th- face out wide to Ricard where he kind of gunned it out there and Ricard didn't really have a chance for it. But there was some yak to be had if they connected on that throw too. Yeah, uh, it's fun to see him catch the football. One of the things I just love is, first of all, he doesn't want to go down. He w- really wants to be pushed out of bounds more than anything else. So sometimes in the middle field, he has to go down anyway. But then when he does get up, he won't surrender the football. He'll he'll hand it into an official's gut. But that's as about as as much as I do. I just love watching that action. And and you know, the the defense never gets to touch the touch the ball or get close to it. This is going right back to the official. All right, what else we got coming out coming up here? Do you feel like like Roman still has some scheme that we haven't seen yet? that may be ready for the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, you know, or even just scheme that they didn't run in the Titans game. I mean, the Ravens do so, so many things now, um, especially in the running game that that is super deceptive. And now they're, you know, you you talked about all these counters that the Ravens ran um, in this past game. They run counters and they do, they literally do everything off of it now, including mm-hmm. throwing the ball. And, you know, I think, I you know, we saw that kind of, the orbit motion has been building up to those Hollywood Brown plays. I think... I don't know if Hollywood can throw the ball or not, but but I have an inclination that the reason they're throwing that ball into the backfield is because they're 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 setting it up so he can throw the ball one of these times. That because, that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool if we saw that. Because it doesn't I, make any other sense to me why it's a backwards lateral in those instances. Do do you get the sense that if the Ravens play three more games this season, that it's possible we might see one where there are zero or very close to zero counters, and all of a sudden we see some new scheme come up where the keys are different but effectively they can run four to six plays out of this new whatever it is <laughs> and and all of a sudden you know you, you're like i've never seen this before they keep running this thing what is it i i just have a feeling roman's still got one of those left yeah well and the ravens don't run zone read anymore or, or they they run it some probably two or three times a game now maybe maybe four or five but very Hardly ever from the pistol Right. Very little that they used to. And, you know, you wonder if you're just lulling all these teams into a sense of like, we're not going to prep for that. This isn't what we're prepared for. Like teams were spending all week working together to figure out how they were going to defend that zone read. And if they could bring something like that back with like some kind of crazy wrinkle that you're talking about, it could be devastating in it in in the context of one drive or one quarter. Mm -hmm. All kinds of fun. Okay, Is there a reason anymore to have Des Bryant active? You know, I'd like to see Devin DuVernay get more snaps. I, uh, you know, and, and Willie Sneed is a good blocker, but the, the dynamic that DuVernay adds on those sweeps and his speed, his like ability to get to the edge, and he's he's a good blocker for his size and what he is. I, I'd rather see, if, if we want a guy who's going to run a short out or be throwing the ball immediately kind of at, at the snap because they're playing off coverage, I want that to be Devin DuVernay and not Des Bryant. Right, right. that makes all kinds of sense. You're, you're right. His smoke route... Uh, you know, you might as well make it a wide receiver screen. Your tight end is going to be split. Your wide receiver, you, you motion him to that side. Your wide receiver on that side, maybe Boykin, who's a good blocker. I know how much you love Boykin as a blocker, and you want to have him on the field for that reason alone, right, Jordan? <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think he's a good blocker. But look, Boykin's got great speed upfield too. You know, do, he brings some of the things that Duvernay does. Just not Duvernay's got a little bit more kind of north south whistle to him, I guess I'd say. <laughs> All right, very good. So anyway, we've we've had that discussion before. Obviously, you could probably sense that. Let's talk about any other skill position players you'd like to hit on while we're here. We've pretty much hit on everybody. But is there anybody else that you want to talk about? I mean, J.K. Dobbins, I think, is going to have a week this week coming up in Buffalo. Um, you know, I think he he was the guy that I think made some poor decisions in terms of running inside or running outside in this game. Um, and I think if the Ravens bring the same kind of counter pool, um, you know, game to this to Buffalo, I think he's going to make better decisions. He's going to have more tape. He's going to have seen what it's like with all those guys in the box. Know what he needs to get to the edge. I think J.K. could have 
a really big game in Buffalo. All right, that'll be key. I want to see one thing I want to see out of all the Ravens, and Dobbins would be one, although I haven't really seen that be a problem for him. That balance is such a big part of his game. Good footwear for this game. I don't care if it hurts a little more to wear those seven spike, whatever they things they are. Everybody's got to be wearing whatever gives them the best possible traction for this game. Since the Cleveland game, I obviously it was the first time I probably noticed this more than than any of the games. But I've gone back and watched a lot of the games over the last, you know, the last week and a half. And the Ravens slip a lot, mm-hmm. and they seem okay with it. And so, you know, I, I guess if you're okay with trading off that comfortability, I agree with you. Like, like we can't, like these guys can't be slipping. You see guys slipping in the passing game, and which is creating all kinds of problems. Those are essentially negative plays where you're not going to get mm-hmm. any yardage. Um, and you know, they just, I, I, you know, I, I don't think the Ravens, you know, uh, their, their equipment guys are bad or anything, but it's just like, you can't have guys slipping like this. <laughs> One more thing. We had an oddball kind of a division of labor in this game. We had 24 defense and 21 offense, which you do not see very often along with three special teams. Now, what's odd about that is in the NFL now, you're forced effectively to have eight offensive linemen or you don't get roster spot number 48. So effectively... Your choice is made for you. And they have only 13 additional spots on offense. That's playing with a skeleton crew. Do you think the Ravens are willing to do it again? Because it seems to me they could make a couple choices that would get Curse active. They probably would want more and Curse in for my money for Welch and Bryant. I also think that Ellis has a good shot not to be active in this game or, and if they advance the Kansas city game um, and, and, you know, you, you probably want another defensive lineman in that mix, but you know, e- even Washington might not, you know, was Washington he, hasn't he was, been active. Yeah, no, it's, 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 wasn't active. Okay, yeah. it's just, if they want to play five or four and I agree with you, I think that's another choice they could make. I just, I, I question if at this point in the season, when it's single elimination, do you really want to risk losing the season on having an injury at defensive line when it can really kill you? Uh, I, I'm I'm not crazy about that idea, and particularly given the guys have been hurt already, I I, pref- I would just my own personal take would be go with five defensive line, even if it's a little bit overdoing it, as opposed to uh, some other position. I, I don't think there's a good reason to go with five inside linebackers. I just don't think there is, and it's only special teams. So if it's special teams, more for Welch is going to be a lot of that in terms of a core special teamer who covers kicks. And when you think about covering kicks. How much of that is choice? And how often does it even happen anymore in the NFL? It's all, it is all it is all choice. That being said, Andre Roberts really likes to run the ball out of the end zone. I've seen him run the ball out of the end zone five yards deep, um, So, which is Buffalo's return guy. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, that may play a part in kind of a decision that the Ravens make this week. Right. And if, if you've got wind in Buffalo, obviously in one direction, those kickoffs are probably going to come up short. And so it will be a, that'll be an issue, maybe even in both, if, if depending on how the wind is blowing and swirling and whatnot. Uh, Josh, what do you have in the mailbag this week? A different future starts with you. That's why GoDaddy does more than help you find a name. You can create, sell, and get found online so any small business can drive change or build an empire. We need a new generation of thinking, your way of thinking. Start different at GoDaddy.com. Enchanted Care Learning Center is ready to welcome your child into the classroom with a curriculum that challenges and inspires students, a daily routine that helps them thrive, plenty of time to play with friends, and most important, enhanced safety measures to keep everybody safe. Preschool is possible at Enchanted Care. Contact us today to schedule an open house appointment on Saturday, January 23rd, or schedule a virtual information session. Visit EnchantedCare.com to find a preschool near you. All right. Uh, you guys did a great job kind of going all over the place and covering a bunch of the mailbag. Uh, the Bills are going to have fans in the stadium this week. You experienced a little bit of fans in the stadium this past weekend. Is 6,700 fans enough to give a home field advantage? You know, there are, there are about 15,000, I guess, 14,000, whatever it was, at Tennessee. And it it was they were there. When people wear masks, they don't just make that much noise. And even when they get up and they're yelling and whatnot, it's still not very loud. Uh, the Titan Stadium, very militant about staying with face coverings, which is good. Um, it's a, a lot of the noise you're hearing is piped in stuff. Okay, so they're still piping in with the mm-hmm. math. With oh, the yeah, All right. big time. I would think 
Buffalo in January, you're covering your face even if there is no <laughs> virus. Probably around. true. All right. Uh, speaking of the weather, you guys talked about the wind being a big problem. Lamar says he's never played in a snow. How do you prepare for that? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know that you prepare for it. You know, it, I, it, I can't be, you know, it's a little more slippery than a, a heavy rain game. But, you know, I don't anticipate that that even if there is a little bit of snow on the ground, it'll be a big deal. It's it's if you got to play in, you know, they're talking about what, like half an inch to like an inch and a half, maybe at the most. You know, if you've got to that's going to be off the field by game time. You're, you're talking about like four or five inches of snow coming down while they're playing in the snow. Then I'd be worried. Yeah, and that can happen in Buffalo. They have their snow belts, and it comes directly off the lake there, lake effect snow, and and uh, it's it can get very bad in terms of, of what we've seen in games before. You can, you can have four inches on the field easily while the game's being played. It can make the game a complete mess. Uh, yeah, the guy from uh, the no, uh, Bills Mafia— No snow machine coming into the castle this week? I mean, I don't know if you remember the famous incident, but this, this happened in, in Buffalo was the— uh, for it was Buffalo, right? Where the where the three nothing game occurred against Miami, and they had the guy who was a a prisoner who was on work release, who oh yeah, who went across the field with this with the snow remover and and cleared off the spot for the field goal kicker. Yeah. Um, anyway, some uh, right. some interesting things have happened there, and uh, I I don't I you know they have more chance, but they have a lot of players from the South, just like the Ravens do. With Brown and uh, and Lamar, of course, and, and others like Bradley Bozeman, who've never played in snow. Uh, Stefan Diggs says he's never played in snow. So, you know, what are you going to do? All right. Surprise Diggs have never played in snow. He seems like a guy who should have by now in his career. But I guess there's not that many games every year, and that's why fans get excited for snow and maybe not the players. Yeah. <laughs> and Minnesota's in a dome, so, so he, was, he was protected up there. That's a good point. All right. Um, the Titans and the Ravens clear, clearly do not like each other and have some anger going on. Do you like that in your teams, or do you want some nice sportsmanship at the end of games? Oh, I I, I love it. I, I like the edge. I like the fight. I, I think that if you're a football team, you've got to take every single edge that you can get, every play and every every half pound more worth of strength that you can pull from wherever you pull it is needed. Every every half second that you can you know reach out with your hand or run faster is, is needed. I think that it, it, hate is good for football in general, and in small doses like this, where it's it's a you know, they know they did something wrong and the Ravens responded to it. Maybe the thing can go away easily. If it were a divisional rivalry, it'd be harder. You know, that the half-life of this hate would be longer because it would be, you know, treasured in the rivalry by the fans, even though the players would get reminded of it by the fans on Twitter and on other places. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is a non-divisional rival. And the, the, the Titans, you know, the fans there consider this their eternal rival. Well, I don't know how. We're not even in the same division, or we haven't been for, for 18 years now, 19 years, whatever it's been. Uh, you know, we're not eternal rivals anymore. We play you less than once a year on average. You know, you did something stupid in the last time you came to Baltimore. It wasn't Baltimore, yeah. And, and we returned the favor. And, and I, it wasn't maybe the ideal time to do it during the game, but I love the fact that they responded. And the more I think about it, you really wanted to do it at the time that the breath was just taken out of the stadium and and the and the players too that they knew their season was pretty much over at the point of the pick to just uh, just stomp on it a little bit. Also, you know, it, this was this was all Mike Vrabel's doing. Like like mm -hmm. you know, he is a whiny whiny little coach, <laughs> and and he deserved every bit of this. John Harbaugh did not push the team to do this. He didn't. He didn't say anything about the team not backing him up. I'm sure he said nothing to them in the locker room about that. Like this was this was player driven, and it was a response to Mike Vrabel getting his players worked up. They're mouthy. They're flipping off players in game. I mean, that that's the way you choose to coach. This is what teams are going to do when they beat you. Do you think Campbell or Peters or Humphrey or one of the defensive players didn't come to Harbaugh before the game and say, "Hey, if we seal this game on defense at some point, we're going to want to go out there and stop on the logo because they bolted." to that logo when that thing was, it was, that was rehearsed like a touchdown dance. 
I, I mean, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but, but you're, you know, Gabe and I were talking about whether or not it was taunting. And I was like, at first I was totally on board, not taunting. I went back and I watched the video <laughs> and it was like, someone's like laying on the logo. Another guy's stomping on the logo. Like Peters is jumping around. Like it was it, like waving. It was explicitly taunting. They definitely deserve the flag. <laughs> yeah. Except that the NFL encourages players to do that in the end zone and run up to that camera and big screen at the end zone, but not the other team. And they celebrate the exact same way. I mean, maybe. I, I mean, yeah. that was my position initially, but when I watched it, was it was pretty explicit. <laughs> players are for some reason sensitive about the logo in the middle of the field. It's just like when you put the logo in your locker room carpet, but you're not supposed to walk. Yeah. On it. So <laughs> it, it's, it's, I don't know. It that. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. All right, uh, well, that takes care of the mailbag this week. We've got, we've got a big Ravens game on Saturday. We've got plenty of film study content. The, uh, this episode's a day late, so we swapped it, so Know Your Foe is already out. The defensive look back with Sarah is already out. we still got By the Numbers coming out. There's a Situation Room is already out this week. It's been a busy week, lots of content, as well as some articles up on the website, Ken, right? Yeah, so we're it'll be <laughs> actually if you're listening to this when we think you'll be listening to this also out today is the defensive article. It's an abbreviated form solely offensive line article. Sorry about that travel illness got to me this week. I'm a little bit behind on things, but hopefully there are there is a set cadre of people out there who really need the numbers for my article and they've been vocal about it on Twitter and you you folks will have it, I promise. All right, that's all out there. Um, Jordan, anything else we can plug for you besides the situation? Yeah, check, you can check me out on Twitter at Raven Sit Room. Um, my co-host is at Gabe Fergie. We're going to try and throw together a quick podcast about this upcoming Buffalo game too, um, so you guys can look forward to a, a little more content. We we're, we're not ready to let this year go yet, and I don't think the Ravens are either. Yeah, how much fun has it been? It's it's been a good one. I'm I'm I I think they're going to steamroll them. So you're expecting big win. Yeah, glad to hear it. Yeah. Jordan, thanks so much for joining us again. This has been a fantastic show. Really appreciate having you on, all your knowledge and and your uh, uh, understanding of the game and, and sharing that with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ken. We'll talk to you next time on Film Study. Hi, I'm Wolfgang. My friends call me Stephen Wolf because I collect specialty teapots. Play the latest scratch-off from the Ohio Lottery, simply called Millions, for a chance to taste the good life and win up to a million dollars. My prize teapots include one that was made from the very first 3D computer model and the teapot that inspired the lyrics, I'm a little teapot. Play the new $30 scratch-off Millions. With one in three odds, a $40 minimum prize, and an 81% payout, you can go hog wild on whatever's your cup of tea. Lottery players are subject to Ohio laws and commission regulations. Please play responsibly. This year has reminded us of the importance of saving for the unexpected. And as a bank, our job is to make that a little easier for everyone. That's why at Huntington, we're so proud to introduce Money Scout. It analyzes your checking account to find money that's not being used and moves it to your savings automatically. It's that simple. So you can always be saving, even now. Learn more and enroll at Huntington.com slash Money Scout. Huntington, welcome. Money Scout is subject to eligibility, terms and conditions, and other account agreements. Member FDIC.